awesome. I presume I'm coming across. Um, I was coming across even before I knew I was coming across. The worst nightmare happened to me this morning. I've always worried about the time when I was on but didn't realize it. Because you see, I sing particularly badly. Um, and I was on and I didn't notice. And then all of a sudden in the middle I heard this voice. But that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> it's like, Calvin, am I on? He's like, yep. Um, so I hope I didn't do too much damage to your worship experience. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nah. Cool, I'm just going to dive right in. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the fact that when we come to hear you, you always speak. You love to speak because you love us. And so this morning, I, I really pray, Father, that the things that we most need to hear, your spirit would take and impact our hearts with. We come with expectation and faith. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Great. So we've been doing, for those who've been around, sorry, I keep feeling like it's going to fall off my ear. My sister always jokes and she's like, you've got the smallest ears in the world. And my, my sister has got the tiniest little mouse ears you'll ever see. Um, but she thinks my ears are small. But <laughs> so anyway, by the way. So we've had, a, we've had a whole bunch of amazing messages on Exodus. And last week, can I just give a shout out to, to, to Calvin? I mean, that was, he got such a difficult passage and it just came alive. And I was in Stellenbosch and I was like, I feel like I'm present in Joburg. As he was, as he was sharing, my heart was like, this is so good. So hard act to follow Calvin, but I'm so keen. So I'm going to share a message called A Home for God. A.W. Tozer said, you are as close to God as you want to be. Put like that, who wouldn't go, wow, sign me up, I'm in. Now the only thing about hearing a statement like that is you think, okay, I can be as close to God as I want to be. Therefore, I'm not as close to God as I should be. Maybe I don't want it enough. You know, I remember hearing Pastor Jim LaFoon share a whole bunch of messages on friendship with God. And if you haven't heard the messages on friendship with God, please do yourself a favor. They're incredible. They'll, they'll set your heart on fire. But I remember hearing, and I was so excited, and I was like, I am going to be God's best, best, bestie. And after a while, I became inconsistent, and stuff happened. You know what I mean by stuff happens? Um, and so... Let's start this message off on a different place rather than you can be as close to God as you want to be. Let's start with this message, and I think it's slightly more encouraging. You can be, or let's, let's, let's say this, God's desire is that he, you be as close to him as you'll allow him to draw you. That you'll allow him to draw you. Because uh, you see, the, the fact of the matter, it's a big deal to want to, s to be friends with God, but bigger than that, far bigger than that, is the fact that God longs and is determined to make us his friends. So much more powerful. Because you see, God is not inconsistent like us. He doesn't just come, okay, will you be my friend? Will you be my friend? Ten years, God will knock. He'll be like, I have you in my sights. Do you know God is determined for you to be close to him? Not just random close. Have you seen the language that is used for our relationship with God in the scriptures? For example, you know, the, the psalmist says of God, all night long, I dream about you and I think about you. It might not seem so dramatic, but the next time you see a very close friend of yours say, all night long, I was thinking about you and dreaming about you. Your, your relationship will take a whole new level of awkward. <laughs> because the, the, the words are so intimate, so close. God wants to be super close to us. As close to you as your breath. That's God's determined intention. Now, the reason why I say that specifically is this. Where we are right now in Exodus, okay, let me, let me start with this. Exodus 19 verse 4 says, You yourself saw what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings to bring you to myself. See, it wasn't about power, it was about relationship. The end game for God is actually relationship. That's what he's all about. And so we started off, you know, with God chose Moses and said, go, Moses, go. I want to set my people free. 
And so Moses went and Pharaoh said no. Then God showed his amazing wonders and he brought them out with this powerful impact. And then he brought them and he, there was m- the miraculous Red Sea and God gave them provision and he gave them the Ten Commandments. This is how a people can live before me. And you've got this moment, six and a half chapters of amazing detail. I say amazing detail, but if you don't actually understand the heart of it, you go, oh. six and a half chapters of how to build the tabernacle. I wonder if the picture, oh, okay, great. Of how to build the tabernacle. And basically this picture of the tabernacle that you'll see up there, this picture is, is what God does for six and a half chapters, every detail, fancy, 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 fancy. And it's, there's all sorts of stuff he gives the exact details. And uh, the next picture just shows the, a summary of what it is. So at the outside you would have this bronze um, place where they would do sacrifices. Then they would have another bronze thing where there was washing. This is in the courtyard. And then you'd go in, there would be a curtain which would go to the holy place where the priests only would go in to minister. And there was a lampstand and there was a table and there was incense. Then you would get this thick, thick curtain. And there was what you would call the Holy of Holies. And that's where the presence of God would dwell. And the only person who went there was the high priest. He went once a year with blood. And if he messed up any part of it, he would die. They'd drag him out. And you've got this. So what is all of this about? All of this is primarily about relationship. God has gone, okay, okay, you, you, I've, I've shown my power. I've shown my provision. But you know it's possible to be led powerfully by God, amazing prophetic guidance, and to experience his provision in these miracles, financial breakthroughs, and so on, and yet to know very little about friendship with God. But God is not okay have it that way. You see, God's most precious gift to us is not the gifts, not the finances, not even the prophetic, this is what I want you to do with my life, your life. It's his very self. God knows that we were designed never to be satisfied with anything less than true, intimate relationship with God. And you know, we get, we get frustrated and bad things start to happen when we don't have intimacy with God. And God knows this. I think it was Augustine who said, our hearts are restless until they find themselves in you, God. And you probably know a whole bunch of people doing strange things. You know, the ultimate thing is their hearts are restless. They might not even know it, but they long to know God. I can make this with 100% certainty. And I can say this as a prophecy over everyone here. You will never be fully satisfied apart from deep, intimate friendship with God. So that's what this message is, is really about. So here's my main scripture, Exodus 29, verse 42 to 46. Starting from verse 42. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. Therefore I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by my glory. In other words, my presence will be there, my real, full, glorious presence. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. It's not about the power of the miracles, as wonderful as that is. It's not about the the prophetic guidance, as wonderful as that is. God will give us all of that just because he loves us. But the end goal, like I said, is to know and experience God. So you you might wonder, what does all these six and a half chapters have to do with relationship? I mean, if you've read it, you know it's about cutting bulls and goats and doves and blood and guts and um, incense and priestly garments and I mean it's, it's elaborate and it's continuous and it's repetitive and it's detail, detail, detail. Those of you who are not detailed people, you're like, okay, maybe the interior designers are excited, maybe the architects, <laughs> but I just want to go to sleep, take me to the other stuff. But it is so powerful and, and, and this is why. The first thing you realize there is we all get pretty excited when we talk about Friendship, relationship with God because we were designed for it. 
but there is first a problem. So as they would go in, do you realize that this was a 3D experience? There would be the smell and the sights of blood, guts, and death everywhere. Yeah. What was it meant to remind them of? It was meant to remind them of sin and death. Because you see, the scriptures actually say that everything had to be sanctified or purified by blood. So they would sprinkle blood on absolutely everything. Read the account. It would be like even the priests sprinkle them with blood. Everything sprinkle them with blood. You know what this tells you? That everything is tainted by sin. Everything is tainted by sin. Y you probably know this reality. Maybe you went some time to like something that you thought could be couldn't be corrupted. Like you went to this charity event. And then someone inserted it and made it about them. Yeah. Maybe it was you. <laughs> but, but, but all of a sudden you realize sin appears everywhere. Maybe you realize yourself like you do something wrong. And all of the times that you've done it before in the past suddenly spring up. And you realize, man, this sin goes deeper in me than I thought. You know what I mean? You thought, I, I, I thought I had forgotten about this. But it's as fresh in your mind as when you did it whenever. And it, it just, it makes you feel slimy. My friend likes to say, you feel like a, 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 a nappy that's been put in the microwave. <laughs> Covered? Not a great picture. B but but, but it, it really tells a story, isn't it? It's like, you look there, you see the guts, you see the blood, you see, and, and you realize that sin is deep, dark. It's even woven itself into our personalities, into our histories. You look back at your family and you just see areas of, of, of sin and twistedness and, and warping and you know you know some of us go to our family gatherings and we are like I don't like the person I become when I'm with my family you know why sin has woven itself into those relationships and you suddenly that pops out and you're like that's not me <laughs> worse than that is the whole idea of death you know it even says that they would put bells on the high priest so that you would he wouldn't die and so there's death of animals, and it reminds us that sin is not just this random little indiscretion. It has deep, deep, painful consequences. You might be hearing me say this, and you might think, okay, we are so sinful at heart, and sin is so present in our midst. Maybe, maybe the problem is God is so holy and so pure that he can't come in, and that's why there's a problem with, with, with friendship with God, is that God is standing at a distance. And, you know, th th there is something to be said for, you know, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, but, 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 but that's for another day. Here, I want to take you to this passage, the first human sin ever, and it's so telling. Genesis 3, verse 8 to 9, it says this, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Who is doing the hiding and who is doing the calling? Man is doing the hiding and God is doing the seeking. Can you see the, the idea is this. The problem with our relationship with God, a lot of it has to do with our sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation. You know, that's what actually drives us. You know, we, we might say, I might say, who wants to be friends with God? And I'm like, put up your hand. And we all put up our hands. And we'll all mean it, except that in our heart, where it really matters, there is often this distance in that's happening. And it's the result of, s of shame, condemnation, and a sense of I deserve judgment, a sense of guilt. And it drives us. You know, those emotions, guilt, shame, condemnation, are dividing emotions. They're separating emotions. They often separate us. And you know, some of us look back at our history and you can't remember a time when you consistently felt welcomed into the presence of God. It seemed like every time you develop started developing some intimacy with God, it seemed like sin suddenly pops up. And your whole history in your mind is one of failure, sin, shame, have you noticed that in the world, the thing people hate most is, you're judging me. And you know, it has less to do with the person who is judging than in their own hearts, this feeling of there's something wrong with me. I am broken, shameful, and guilty. It's not just in the world. I say that in the world. You know, often, if you look in general and you have discussions with Christians and you go deeper, 
there's this underlying sense of guilt and shame. Sometimes it's vague, but you know what it does? It separates and hardens our hearts from God because we, we assume God sees us how we see ourselves. Right. Not welcome. And then we talk about God and we'll get excited. And we say, God wants to be your friend. He loves you so much. And we speak the truth. And, we, and, and in our heads we go, okay, God wants to be my friend. In my heart we go, who would want to be my friend? How would a holy God choose me and draw this close? How can I believe that? You know, our brains won't, won't say that, but our hearts will. And so that's the problem. But let's talk about the solution. One thing that you will notice reading those six and a half chapters that I mentioned is God says to, to Moses, here's the plan for how you should build the tabernacle. And again and again, he keeps making this statement. He's like, make sure you stick 100% to the plan. In other words, Moses, don't get creative now. I don't need your input in the process. Do exactly what I'm giving you. You know what the point is? The point is here is the solution directly from heaven. This is not a man-made solution. Do you know often we think that we look at the tabernacle and we go, oh, wow, this was a novel idea. You know it wasn't. There were all sorts of temples at the time. All the peoples had temples, and they had their little God in this temple. And what they did was they would come to appease. They would have this idea of what makes this God happy. And God goes, no, 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 no. The solution must come from me. Because, you see, the problem is religion yeah. is man's t attempt to deal with the guilt of sin, but without dealing with the heart. And only God can do that. So he says, here is the solution. It's coming from me. Moses, don't put your hands on it. Don't add to it. Don't come up with this creative way. This is one of the most encouraging scriptures for me in the whole of the Bible. It's Hebrews 10, verse 11 to 14. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Religion can't do it. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. There are a couple of things I want you to notice from that passage. One of them is he sat down. Do you know what that is? That is Jesus' mic drop. It's done. He sits down when it's all completed. You see that he's, he's making the, Hebrews is making the point that the other priest would offer this, offer, offer, and the idea it says here is that it, it seemed to cover up for a moment, but you know, the second that it was done, sin seemed to pop up again, and there'll be another time for a need for an offering. But this is the most powerful scripture. If we can live this, Jesus is saying, once and for all, sin is no longer your problem with your relationship with God if you're a Christian. Sin is not a problem in your relationship with God because Jesus has, notice that word there, made us perfect. You know, unless it was written in the scriptures, you guys would go, you're crazy. Because, you know, we, we come and we're like, okay, God, I'm coming to you trying. You know, that those people, they ask, how are you doing? Oh, I'm trying. Um, and, and it's that idea, we get this trying mentality that, God, I'm offering you something as good as I can offer. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. Perfect. You know, the thing about friendship is that when someone sees you in a good way, how, what does that do to your heart? Think about your best friends. The re part of the reason they're your best friends is because they only see the good stuff in you. And Jesus is going, no, I don't only see, I see the perfection in you. This is not heresy, this is true. You know, some of us need to take that word perfect and roll it around in our minds and allow it to sink into our hearts. Because I'll be honest with you, often I go, good enough. And God goes, no, perfect. Say it, perfect. I'm not saying to you, say it, but I am God saying, um, you know, 100%. Notice the word, he has made. For one sacrifice, he has made perfect. Forever. You know, part of the problem with relating to God is the inconsistency of feeling that you are, you are good sometime, and sometimes you are just failing. You're just missing it. And God is going, no, no, no. If you're going to relate to me, 
going to have to realize that I've settled this thing. I need no more assurances from you. Come because I've made you perfect. And the, and the last thing I will say on this is this. He says, forever those who are being made holy. Just notice the order now. Make perfect and being made holy. Isn't that odd? We would have reversed it. We would have had being made holy until we are perfect. You know, one day I'll be perfect. God goes, no, I gave you perfect. And when you come close, you'll find that you're getting holy. Do you know that's... Uh, Friendship with God will absolutely 100% always change you to be more like him. Some of us have been struggling with certain things that we're like, if I could just deal with this, I could connect with God. And God goes, no, 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 no. Connect with me and you will deal with that thing. It's, it's, it's the reverse order. That's how he takes it. God has settled it. Sin doesn't separate us. What we believe about what God has done separates us. I won't go on any further. So let me, how do I end this? I en I'll end with this. So what? <laughs> All of this stuff I've been saying, how, what do we do with it? And this, this passage of scripture probably just preaches itself. You might have noticed that I've s I'm preaching on Exodus, but I've s mentioned so much of Hebrews, and I'm going to mention Hebrews again. But here's a, here's a thing that I don't know if you realize, but Hebrews is one of the best ways to understand Exodus. Read them together p in parallel and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe. And it's just like, so anyway. Hebrews 10 verse 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. So there's the advice of the guy from Hebrews says, let us draw near. You know, the, f the, the important thing to do now is to come close, is to draw near in full assurance that faith brings. You see, this, this, this scripture is basically saying this. It's saying that all that Jesus has done should settle our hearts. It says any perceived distance between you and God, anything that made you feel like you couldn't be God's best, best friend is an illusion and God has settled it. He's dropped the mud. Jesus has done it. He's saying, take your stand on that truth. Th the basic thing I've said here, you might be like, oh, but that's the basic gospel. That's the whole point. It doesn't require cleverness. It requires belief. Do you know how you become friends with God? You accept it. Do you know at this moment, if you were to see Jesus right now, he would be walking through the room going, you got it? You got it? Are you coming? Are you drawing close? Uh, the, and this entire message is, come close. Every day you have been made close. This passage says that the way has been opened up. Previously, that sense of condemnation, that sense of God being against you, that sense of God going, hooks, wipe your shoes. It's gone. You, you, know, you, you, know, you know that thing where you, you get your shoes muddy and you know your mom will be upset if you put that messy shoe on the carpet. God is the exact opposite. He says, come, let me wash those shoes. Let's do this together. God is saying, come, come, come. And, and, and in Hebrews, it's saying this. It's saying, take your stand because it's saying it'll be tested. You know, I, one of my fears in sharing this message is that I would get hopes up and then we would go, okay, and we'd hit the real world. But the writer of Hebrews goes, okay, no, 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 no. It's saying, wrestle with this. It's saying, take your stand. It's saying that this has been done, therefore, wrestle through this, push through this. You know, one of the things, I told a friend of mine this, and, and she was like, uh, I can't see how you could do this. I said, no matter how badly I've let God down, I've told God that I will start my day in the same way. I'll start connecting with him 
before we talk about what happened. It might sound like a random thing, but, but you know what it is? It tells me this. It tells me that I take my stand that even if I feel like God is not 100% going, come, let's chat. He is. And, 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 and often, you know what happens is we start dealing with stuff in the distance. So we, we got this issue and we get, God has this idea of how he feels towards us and, and he's going and we, we build it and then we start, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can I, can I just come? And then we have this whole conversation with ourselves and God is not having that conversation with us. He's getting, shh. You know, you know those, those wacky, weird, romantic movies where, where the, the, the person just starts talking and the other person just kisses the person on the cheek and it's like, oh. I know it's kind of weird. Some of the guys are like, ooh. But, but you know, th- th- God is not afraid to be mushy sometimes. He's not afraid to pour his heart out because God longs for our friendship. He's done it all in Jesus. And he, the death of Jesus, that's, that's, that's at the core of this. The death of Jesus is going, I am determined to make you friends. Will you believe it? You know, for some of you guys, you look back and... There's so much stuff that seems to have ingrained itself. It seems like it's, w- to- it's, it's woven itself into your personality and the enemy goes too deep, too messy, too dark, too far gone. No way. And God goes, no, but the blood of Jesus goes deeper, wider. You don't have a sin problem, you have a belief problem. You don't believe deeply in my love yet. You seem to think that there's a barrier between you and me. There is not. Marie was talking about God speaking to us. You know, often I notice the problem with people who have an issue with being able to hear God's voice. It has nothing to do with gifting, wiring, anything, except this fundamental belief. Has God chosen me to be his friend? Will he speak? Will he draw close? Will it be free? Or is there something that makes God pull away? Friends, can I say that there is absolutely nothing? If you're not a, if you're not a believer, either listening, either listening on, online or here in the room, this is what I want to say. For you, there actually is a problem. There is a sin problem that's separating you from God. But can I also give the good news that Jesus has dealt with that sin problem? The solution has been there. And so God would say, would you come? Would you come? Would you draw close? He's saying, even for you, come. I'll deal with your sin problem if you will trust Jesus. So I'm going to pray for all of us. And and the main thing that I want to do is I want the Holy Spirit to deal with our hearts. If condemnation or guilt or shame has been a thing for you, if it's been something that has weighed on you and you thought, if I dealt with, if I deal with this, I can grow in my relationship with God. Today, God is offering you the free step into closeness. That's the solution. I might go so far as to say, don't focus your eyes on that area. Focus your eyes on him. Let me pray for us as we close. Father, I remember this morning the fact that you are determined to make us friends, sons and daughters. There's nothing that can keep us back from your presence. There's nothing that can hold us off. Jesus, I thank you that you you have sat down. You have done what we couldn't do with our resolve, with our attempts to make it right. I thank you that your cleansing touch that goes into the deep, deep places, even into our past, that goes even into our future, that goes everywhere and says perfect. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would write perfect across our hearts. I pray where we're, where we're trying to, to figure out how this can be true. I pray that in our hearts we would believe it and we would receive it. We would receive the gift of friendship from you. And for every person who doesn't yet know you, Jesus, 
I pray today, even as they make the commitment to say, Jesus, I want to be your friend. I want to know you. Holy Spirit, give them the confidence as they repent of their sin and as they turn to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let me hand over to Andrew.